right, let me give you my bias right away. Uh, I've gotten to know Jody Smith a little bit. Uh, she's the director of lands and compliance. Uh, she also works with the Metro Flood Diversion of Flor uh, Authority, which really means she works with the FM diversion. But she understands lands, uh, bringing lands in, you know, how we go about securing them. You know, and she, she can't seem to get rid of this state job that she's got. Uh, <laughs> but, but the truth of the matter is she's in the process of doing just that. Uh, Jody Smith, good. To, well, here's my bias. I think she's good at her job. Uh, Jody, uh, good to have you coming down the road with us. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be on the show with you. Let's let's get this out of the way. Tell people what the Director of Lands and Compliance for the state of North Dakota does. Well, in my role, what we deal with at the FM uh, diversion is we have a lot of land. Um, we have a lot of land that we needed to acquire. We have a lot of flowage easement, environmental easements. Um, and even after the program is operational, there's a lot to do with the land. Um, we need to get back out there, make sure everyone's taking care of it, make sure that we're cleaning up debris when a flood does come, um, and making sure there aren't noxious weeds growing out there. There will always be this role within um, the FMDA. And if you don't mind, I'll just call it the diversion of Authority. So this is a long-term role that they fulfilled uh, starting on November 1st. That's when I started in this role. And so I'm still on that learning curve. I know yesterday um, when I was on your show, I had to defer a couple of questions. I know uh, a few of our um, listeners, a few phone calls back, but you know, it's going to take me a while to onboard because it's a complex. Um, a lot of people like to think of land being black and white and it's not. Well, it's land, a $4 billion dollar project. It's, I mean, it's, it's an expensive project. Right. Yeah. And it's it's going to impact a lot of people. And so, you know, taking that time to kind of get to know the program, get to know kind of how I can be the most effective. Uh, we have a lot of partners around this community helping us make sure it's successful. And my job is really to remove those barriers um, and make sure, again, that the communications are going out to the landowners, uh, that I'm always open of ears, open of mind to listen to any feedback that can be provided so I can do my job better. Well, and we've always been honest with each other. Uh, yes, you know, my job in, in radio before I did uh, some work in TV as well, uh, I wasn't exactly kumbaya when it came to the, the diversion because of the land use, uh, because you know, I come from the south end of the valley, and I have a lot of friends as I make my way up to Fargo. Personally, uh, these are things that were happened long before you got there. But personally, I think that there was a lot of politics involved with where that line was, south to north. Uh, that being said, the line is there. It's, it's decided. Yes. And, and so how we make it fair for those individuals on the south side of that is an area that I'm I'm really concerned, and it needs someone like you that that doesn't do this based upon uh, the politics of this person or that person. Uh, how do you make the peace with those individuals? Because they're still not there. Uh, a after we did some radio yesterday, my phone lit up uh, saying I was too easy on you. I mean, how how do we how do we get them to a point where they? They maybe are never going to like it, but they move past that. And I think, Joel, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, the project's going to move forward. We know it's going to move forward. Uh, again, my job is to come in and make sure that, you know, there's a fair and just compensation is provided. That's that's kind of where the differential is. We know the defined area. We know where the land acquisitions had to occur, and that's been completed. Um, those that we haven't able to acquire went through the quick take process, and we have some sitting in the courts waiting for resolution right now. In about another month, so probably the first week of March, maybe the last week in February, we'll be sending out several hundred Floyd easement packets. Um, those will go to that area that you're talking about, the um, upstream mitigation area and your friends down there. That's where we're going to go in. Um, we're going to make an offer to them based off appraisals that were completed by Crown Appraisals. Crown has gone out there, done an assessment, applied the same principles to everybody's parcel of land, then it comes back to our team we have a quality assurance check, and that means we have somebody just going sure, through making sure that Crown took the necessary steps in the process um, so that all those are valid. That actually has been completed at this point. All those appraisals will be brought to the boards um, at the end of February. So on February 24th, you'll see a lot of these going through and approved. That's when those flow easement packets will go out. Um, we have land agents in place uh, so that they can go out. They can help um, any landowner make their ways through those packets. Uh, we're going to have some com community meetings set up March 14th through the 22nd. So landowners can come. Um, we'll be in those various communities. Um, I'll be available. I know Eric Dodds from A2S. All of our land agents will be available to answer any questions. 
questions that the landowners might have. And then we encourage the landowners, um, if they're not comfortable with the, the amount that they, they think is there or they want a second opinion, to find another appraiser, have that appraiser complete their process, and then bring that information forward to us. At that point in time, then what we, we enter what we would call negotiations and our land agents really kind of help us step through that. That information then is brought back to the various boards uh, to take into consideration and to, de to determine if they're going to accept that negotiated amount. Well, I've known Eric Dodds uh, for years. I know what a handshake is from Eric, and it's solid, and it's, it's good. So you've got a good partner when it comes to going out there and telling the truth. But I want to give you a scenario that's going to cause you trouble. Are you ready? Okay. Uh, I'm ready. You go up north of Fargo, up by the, the National Cemetery up there close to the VA, and the land next to it sold, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm close to this, sold for about $22,000 an acre. Now, that's Red River Valley farmland, and granted, it's, it's close proximity uh, to the city of Fargo, but as the city of Fargo goes south, um, you know, th these individuals' land becomes more valuable. Now, granted, they're on the, the upstream side. They're on the wrong side of the diversion. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what today might be worth $12,000 an acre could easily be worth that $22,000 an acre another day. How do you calculate it then? How do you, if I'm that landowner and I see this type of growth, you know, and you're telling me my land's worth $10,000 an acre, rough figures. I'm not saying that's what you're saying. Uh, right. You know, how do I make sure I get the 18000 And Joel, that's a good question. And it's very difficult. I mean, it's very difficult to... Um, presume something that maybe perhaps possibly will happen in the future, right? Is, is that that value in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 80 years? Um, that's part of those conversations. We recognize that the um, appraisal environment is changing very rapidly. Um, the value of the lands, particularly in the upstream mitigation area, are changing very rapidly. We recognize that if we have an appraisal that's more than a year old, it's it's outdated. Um, and at some point in time, we have to have that appraisal reissued. Because again, looking at kind of what can happen um, or what should have happened or what would have happened without this project, those are all things that we have to take in consideration. And I know our appraisers look at that. If somebody could have built something in the UMA, um, if we had not put this project in place, that's taken into consideration when those appraisals are done for the flow age easements. Um, and again, I haven't seen those numbers yet. They haven't been passed on to me, so I haven't been able to go in and kind of dig through any, any specific parcel at this point in time, um, but I do anticipate being able to see those in the upcoming weeks. Well, those numbers are going to pass through the Knickerbocker and Hickson like crazy. You know, I do anticipate that they will, so I have been told that. Which so. for our viewers, um, that's the local pub down in Hickson. That's the local pub, and so, I know I've mentioned this to you before. Um, you know, we recognize that all, all of the appraisals will go out the door essentially at, essentially at the same time, um, so that maybe not on the specific date, um, but within about one week of each other, we haven't broken it down to any sections. Um, so all the landowners who will be affected in that particular area can expect to get their appraisers um, within the same amount of time frame. So in the little bit of time I have left, Jody, the, the, yeah. the biggest thing to me that that you step into and have to clean up is the fact that there is a perception. And in some cases, I think the reality that people of means uh, got way more uh, in the beginning out of this than the people without means, meaning the people of Hickson, which is a village, not a not a, a an incorporated city, in the uh, Baki edition and, and right in front of it, and then you you take Oxbow. Well, there's a lot of people in Oxbow who got a couple bucks in their pocket. They got a golf course. They got a dike put around it. They got all of those things. And so making sure those people, those other people, more blue-collar people get treated in a fair and decent way is going to have to be part of your job. And so I'm just going to ask you, because I'm going to call them and tell them that you're on tonight, uh, you know, is that something you can pledge and promise to do? That's part of my job. I mean, that's part of my job. And I know I had that crossed to bear as the land commissioner for this great state of North Dakota um, and treating everybody with 
fairness, inequality. Um, we'll apply the same principles, recognize that something that's in mitigation zone one um, may value something different than in mitigation uh, zone four. And so I do recognize that, but you know, I've been having a lot of communications with some of the landowners in that area. Um, also noted that I've reached out to some of the attorneys uh, representing some of those landowners because I want to better understand how we can better serve them and encourage uh, settlement agreements and those negotiations. What are some resounding themes of some frustrations landowners might have so I can incorporate that into that upcoming process that we have because we have we have a long ways to go. We have several hundred full easements to attain. And again, my job is to just, you know, make it as smooth a process as I possibly can. Um, again, I can't relieve the pain. Um, I can't relieve some of that um, consternation that comes from having to leave your family homestead. I'm not going to pretend that I can. I can't I'm not going to pretend I know what that feels like. But again, my job is to really to ensure that there is a fair process applied across um, everyone, regardless of how much money you have you sitting in your bank account, as you kind of gently put it. Um, and even if you don't have legal counsel, I know that's um, getting legal counsel is something of a privilege to some individuals, right? Because that costs money. Um, and again, I want to ensure that those people who can afford legal counsel get the same the same treatment as those who can't afford it. And they just come straight to our land agents to try to work with us directly um, and in creating that fairness like we noted before. So, Well, it starts by being in the room with them. And it sounds like uh, you're willing to do that, which is a big first step in, in in terms of them trusting you, uh, I do want to tell you that Beck News uh, and, of course, my radio show are two great tools to communicate. And I hope you do that again.